Hello. Welcome to Behind the Headlines with Times of Israel. And we have with us a very special guest, Chef Mike Salomonov, speaking to us from Philadelphia. How are you, Mike? I'm great. How are you doing? We are okay coming out of our third lockdown here in Israel. Um, and I just want to give a little bit of an intro to you for, for those who don't possibly don't know who you are. Um, Mike Salmanov is the five-time five time James Beard Foundation winner, a partner in Cook and Solo, which is his uh, restaurant group with his partner, longtime partner, business partner, Steve Cook, Stephen Cook. And really what Mike Salmanov is known for is bringing Israeli cuisine, Israeli food um, in a very different way to the American public and specifically to Philadelphia, where all of your restaurants are located. Um, winner of many, many different awards having to do with cookbooks and restaurants, and we can talk about all of that. But we're, and one of the reasons that we wanted to have Mike on behind the headlines is that he is, he has been working on a sort of a coronavirus era show of his own, Bringing Israel Home. It's a 16 episode show on Vimeo. It's free and it's a lot of fun to watch. We actually wrote about it a few weeks ago and that's what brought about this idea to have Mike live here with us. So welcome to you, Mike, in your kitchen. Thank you. Thanks for having me and thanks for the intro. Um, I want, I mean, for everybody that is not in Israel, what is being locked down for the third time or exiting lockdown for the first third time mean? What is a, what right. is it? <laughs> Because we know what we hear is that most of the country is vaccinated appropriately. Why, why are you still, what's going on? Right. Good question. I never usually get to answer questions, but I'm happy to. Um, so basically, as I said, third lockdown, this lockdown, this third lockdown started in December, um, was pretty heavy duty, really everyone at home. And in the midst of that lockdown, I mean, home, no school, things closed, stores closed, really just like pharmacies and supermarkets, malls closed, gyms closed, nowhere to go, really. And you couldn't, you didn't want to. The vaccine, the vaccination effort began midway through the third lockdown. So what does that mean? Briefly, Israel ha is, uh, operates it within a socialized medicine program and we're about 8 million plus people here. And the government bought uh, vaccines from Pfizer. And because we are such a small country, you know, the size of New Jersey is what we always say, right? Yes. Because it's such a small country, there was, uh, it's a very automated health system. Literally, I get WhatsApps and iMessages from my health provider. Um, and so essentially, Anyone who wanted to get vaccinated, which was a good about half of the half of the population, was able to, and with, it was done in a very sort of very smooth manner. In the sense, if you went to like, I went to my local basketball stadium, and that's where my local healthcare provider had set up this huge vaccine vaccination station. Um, so, what does it mean now that we're coming out of the third lockdown? It means that. Uh, commerce stores are opening up again, hairdressers, gyms, cultural institutions, which have been closed for months and months and months, uh, malls, schools for most grades, but not middle school and, high, and all of high school. Those kids are still Zooming at home. And what it means really in the briefest of ways is that uh, you get a green passport if you've been fully vaccinated with two shots. The green passport allows you to enter, to go here, to go to a club, to hear a concert, to go to um, one an art house movie theater, not regular movie theaters, malls, museums, all those kind of places. They are not requiring people to have a green passport, but they are practicing social distancing, masking. Um, you know, those are the sort of the basic regulations for entering and being in a public place. It's a lot more detailed than that. Does that sort of answer your question? That does. I mean, I'm just curious as to what happens after the next, like, should this be right. the lockdown? 
Right. So here, just to give you a little bit, a brief snapshot, because I know everyone wants to hear from you. Uh, what, what you have to say is a lot more interesting. I mean, it's so it's it's fascinating. And the contrast between the way that this is being handled in the U.S. versus Israel is so sort of wide, you know. So right. I, Well, small country, right? Um, basically, I, we don't know how it's going to go. You know, there are people who don't get vaccinated because they choose not to. They might be teachers. They might be in other kind of public positions. So if they get corona, as it's called in Hebrew, or if someone in their family does and they bring it to the classroom or to some other setting, they can still send their class into quarantine. Um, and that's the complication of how that's all going to exactly, how, how, how that's all going to work. The other 4 million people in Israel, which includes kids, what's actually going to happen? You know, is, is, are the vaccines going to be given to younger kids at this point? 12 and up now right now it's 16 and up mm. so we don't really know so tell I, me how it is in philadelphia what's it like by you guys so philly's okay i mean we're um i believe the cases are kind of are de declining slightly um it's a little bit of a weird time because i think that everybody is sort of fatigued by this and yeah. because there's vaccine and because it's been basically a year I think everybody's just kind of ready, you know, and our behavior now, even though the death rate is like much higher than it was, you know, eight months ago, you would never like walk, even in the street, you would like, you just wouldn't even go. It was like empty. Philly was like empty for a while, you know? Um, and I think that people are just kind of ready to get back to it. And I don't know. I mean, it's a strange thing. Like restaurants are opening now. Um, indoors partially i can't remember if 25 or 50 percent we haven't well wow. we haven't opened yet indoors we haven't had to luckily and i don't judge anybody that that did. i mean you know luckily we didn't have to we have a good relationship with american express and resi and they built these outside tents at sahav uh -huh. so heated tents which have been amazing and we've managed i've got a couple of my contracting buddies built these like heated structures that you know what wow. Freezing cold and windy, it's, you yeah, know. Yeah, freezing. But um, but people are, are resilient and they want to eat out. And we've done the pivot, even though I sort of hate that term because I don't think I don't think that gives enough credit to the pain that, that small business owners have had to go through. But everybody's kind of, you know, just kind of hanging on. And uh, there were stimulus checks for that were helping people out, individuals and unemployment, and um, way more than in Israel certainly. And uh, so I don't know. I mean, I feel a lot for everybody here. I really feel for small business owners in, in Israel back home. Yeah. I can't imagine what it's like. I think that our, all the sort of marginalized communities everywhere, U.S. and Israel. Yeah. You know, I think that our countries are never measured by their weakest and most vulnerable population. And unfortunately, uh, that I think should be the measure of all of this. So, uh, you know, I, I, we're upset about not being able to go out and so on and so forth. And like, I can't imagine, you know, Philly is a wonderful, beautiful city that I love very much. It also is like the poorest large city in America. So, you know, when kids are out from school for a year and they have like single parents that are- What do they do about lunch and breakfast, right? At lunch, that was the biggest, that was one of the largest issues is that when school was canceled, it meant that there were like, whatever, I don't know, a million, a few hundred thousand, I don't even know. I mean, right. it's too many kids that uh, don't receive adequate um, food, you know, food source. Like, so right. it, affected, it affected so much. And um, I don't know, it's just really scary and sad. And I think that we all are probably learning a lot from this. And uh, hopefully the end is in sight, you know. I really hope so. Really hope so. Mike, tell, tell us a little bit more. I know we all hate the word pivot now, <laughs> but what, what, did, what did you guys do? What did you do personally? What did you do in terms of all these restaurants that were shut for how long? What did yeah. that mean for you? So we had 460-ish employees March 15th wow. last year, and then we basically had to let everybody go. Um, we kept our managers on. So their insurance went lapse, which is another thing that like- Health insurance, just to, I'm just specifying. Exactly, exactly. Because insurance is private here, obviously, and it's, it's the employer, right? So right. 
if we canceled everybody's health insurance, it would be really difficult to renew it. So we had about um, 60 managers. And I'm not sure, like, you know how expensive insurance is in the US, it's no joke, right? So we kept the managers on, um, so their insurance would lapse with a like very reduced rate. And then everybody else, we sort of collected unemployment immediately. We set up a disaster relief fund and we sold gift cards with 100% of the proceeds, proceeds going to this thing so we could distribute um, cash to people like immediately. Wait, uh, so gift cards where people would buy like a gift at one of the restaurants? Yeah, so Steve and I, um, we each contributed $20,000 on wow. particularly the day. And then we raised another 110 through gift card sales, which, wow. all, which all went to our staff. So, you know, which is wonderful. It's not, you know, a staff of 400 people is not that much. And then we started to do these big Shabbat orders that would, um, uh, like we would do whatever Shabbat dinner from Zahav for like- really. Two- and then we do one of those a week and then hundred percent of those, that proceeds would go to our managers. So we were just kind of going back and forth and then um, hiring people back as, as we could with all these like right. little programs. We would do one day of like falafel takeout, one day of hummus, one day of, you know, a Fisher Montreal meat. And, and then um, slowly we got to about like now Dizengoff and Goldie got to seven days of servo. Oh, um, fantastic all out, outside like there's no obviously dining. it's all outside in these bubbles you're saying so it's either in the bubbles or it's takeout i mean the thing about goldie it's a falafel yeah so it's like it's made for takeout these sure. are the same thing it's pita and hummus it's a hummus yeah it's like easy kfar which is our bakery is um we were doing four days of takeout okay. um, delivery and coffee and all that and then Ed fisher three nights of dine in plus takeout Especially for Chagim, we do like specials, like whatever, you know, <laughs> Shishana-y kind of stuff. Right. And we're going into Pesach again, which is like crazy to me that there's going to be hard another. to imagine. Yeah, I mean it's really depressing. And then we're also uh, and so Sahab has been open five nights a week in these yurts, these tents, plus wow. Abe Fisher and for uh, Zahav, and now for Kfar, we're doing and actually Federal Donuts, which is our donut shop, which has also been open because it's kind of made for takeout. Right. Being, um, we're on Gold Belly. Gold Belly is a company actually founded by an Israeli American. Um, okay. they're, uh, they're actually shipping, uh, shipping dinners like all over the country. So like you could be in LA oh. and you can get a Zahav lamb dinner. Uh, That's great. All with like 12 pitot and hummus salads, rice that we show you on a, on like a YouTube channel, how to like crisp up or whatever. And then the lamb malabi for dessert. So it's, we have a bunch of different ways that we're kind of making this work. And then eventually, like when our entire staff is, is fully vaccinated, then we'll consider kind of opening up indoors. Wow, that is just a huge, sorry, pivot, huge turnaround that you did. Um, I love the descriptions of your holiday and Friday night meals. It feels very Israeli, you know, like what, and also really mirrors what so many chefs did here which was that they turned to catering and to takeout in ways that they had never done before. Listen, you don't get in. A lot of chefs don't become chefs because they see themselves like putting a bunch of food in boxes and selling it. Right. Right. And that, you know, that was, um, I, we're not above that. And this is what service is, honestly. I mean, mm-hmm. we're, we're in the hospitality business, right? So I want to make people feel good. We use food, we use service, we use music, we use wine, whatever to like, get to that point and if it has to be through takeout if we have to connect through instructional videos if i have to bring people into my home on wednesday nights at eight o'clock every week to talk about israel and food and the things that i do normally then this is what it is i I don't know we have no choice i mean we could have closed all the restaurants and we walked away and believe me that was like (laughs) We weren't that far away from that. And, how, you know, it's been a year. I mean, this- right, I wanted to ask, how long did it take you from March till you figured these kinds of oh, you know, turnarounds? Totally incremental. Totally incremental. incremental. Mm-hmm. I thought when we closed in March, and we closed a day before it was sort of mandated. I mean, that weekend, the weekend before we closed, we, a Laser Wolf, which is our Shipudia, was open five weeks. Five weeks. And... Right. We were having a busy weekend and, you know, the mayor's like, 
everyone go support your restaurants. And I was like, I, you know, I don't think this is like, right, dude, there's all these people gathered, you know, it's a hub. There's on busy nights, there's 30 people waiting in the vestibule to be sat. Right. So I was like going to Zahab, I'd go to Abe Fisher, I'd go to Laser Wolf the weekend before everybody shut down. And I was like, this is a huge problem. But 40 restaurateurs met in the private dining room of Zahav mm-hmm. um, and came to it. Uh, and voluntarily, we decided collectively to close. This is before. This and- is like mid-March, basically. Mid-March. This is when, I mean, there was obviously no federal guidance. Mm-hmm you know, which, which you could say a lot of, um, from a state level and a city level that we, nobody knew what was going on anyways. And just from a public health standpoint, we decided to do that, which is like a lot of chutzpah, right? For all of us, <laughs> we have to shut down. We cannot be open. Right. It's not safe. Um, so, uh, you know, we had, we have 16 leases like in our company. Right. And that's just a lot to yeah. come. With. But, um, so I think that, it was incremental. I mean, for, we were closed, closed for like the first two weeks. And then we started um, opening. We did a couple, uh, we were partnered with um, Broad Street Ministry, which is um, um, feeds hungry Philadelphians. One of many. Okay. Do, One of many. Mm-hmm. Vulnerable community. Um, as I said to Philly is like a, a, you know, wonderful and, you know, also a uh, super poor large city. So, you know, there's a uh, thousands and thousands of people, um, tens of thousands of people a day that, that are hungry, that needs to be fed and, and broad right. streets. A lot of work with them and we've partnered with them for a very long time. So we started to do uh, meals for them. Actually, American Express was giving us funds to cook meals for uh, for, for the Broad Street guests. Which That's was pretty amazing. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. Oh. And, um, and then we started to do these one-offs too. And we would allocate, as I said, it was like allocating money towards our managers and then you know, employees, and then we could hire people back. So we're probably at about, I think that we've got around 200 or so team members now back. Oh, that's fantastic. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think it's, you know, we're doing as good of a job as we can. You're right. I was going to say, you're doing, you're doing what you can, basically. So what's also interesting is that essentially you started spreading your food farther because of the situation that you were in, which is kind of unexpected. And uh, I imagine there's been like a nice reverberation from that. Um, You know, it's cool. Like, I think that for us, I don't know. I I want to see like a Zahav meal plated in somebody's house in like Tulsa, Oklahoma is amazing. (laughs) That's awesome. I love it. And, um, you know, like this sort of reach that we have with our show too, you know, we have, you know, nearly a thousand people a week basically watching live and then it's on demand afterwards. So people are watching and making food and I really, I'm proud. I'm very proud of it. I think it's really, really cool. We have this great partnership with, um, Jewish food society and, uh, JFS, right. I just think it's, this is what it is. This is what we do. And it's just, so the actual pivot not from a business standpoint, because that just the, the, the emotional pivot. Uh, we need the emotional pivot, and that's kind of what comes first. I think that's what yeah. we have to have. And without that, um, I don't know what we would have done. And as I said before, there were moments where I was like, maybe we just shut this down, and you know. Thank God you didn't. Wait before we talk. Wait before we get to. I have a lot of questions about your about the show about bringing Israel home. Yeah. First, tell us what you are starting to chop up there on your board. So I am just um, making a little bit of a, it's a, it's a sort of take on kanafe, I guess. Um, and it is uh, halloumi cheese wrapped with a kataipi dough, you know, which is the sort of shredded wheat phyllo, um that we're going to sear and then um, just put like a little honey and orange blossom on. So it's kind of a sweet. Delicious. It's like the mozzarella stick, I guess, of uh, the Middle East. <laughs> I never thought of it that way, but that's a good description. Yeah, so halloumi, you know, is from Cyprus, and um, uh, kanafe originally is from Nablus. It's Palestinian, and but the Turks and the I mean the Ottomans kind of took it and spread it around. It's actually my Bulgarian family makes kanafe all the time, so I thought that this, really, even though we're doing it, um, we're gonna do orange blossom and honey and pistachios, perhaps if I have some in my pantry. If you have, we would love to see that. <laughs> to be evocative of uh, the dessert that we, that we love. Um, I think that uh, 
there's something to this about the Balkan, you know, I don't know. Food is just so culture. Yeah. Culture, but also it's like interest. The Ottoman sort of influence on the way that everything was just kind of moved around by the Turks. I think right. is, needs diving in there. Yeah. It needs its own sort of cookbook, I think. So I'm just going to wrap the, um, halloumi with this cheese and I'm going to, or I'm going to wrap the halloumi with this dough and I'm just going to kind of wrap and fry it up in some butter. Okay. I'm always happy. Me, right? I wish I could be eating it. Okay. But it's fine. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll go and make some myself a little bit later. And we're going to have this recipe by the way, um, at behind the headlines in when we, when we are, when we put this show up. So that's good to know also. Um, all right, Mike. Yes. So, a lot of different things over the course of this year. And you added something else, which is this, as you said, bringing Israel home, these 16 episodes that are also on demand and that are uh, very involved. They, they have you in your home cooking. Mm -hmm. They always have at least one guest and the guest list is incredibly varied, which yeah. I had some, I wanted to ask you about that as well. Sure. From Ravit Alani of the Yemen Blues, he's a musician, to actor Sasson Gabay, to chef Osama Dalal. And I'm thinking, all right, I know you come to Israel a lot usually and you get to you meet a lot of people, but that's that's varied. So first tell us, given everything that was going on, what made you dive into this idea of doing um, 16 episodes of a show out of your kitchen? So you know, I got used to cooking in my home kitchen for the first time ever. Um, I love that. I think that's pretty hilarious. I know. I mean, that's the big sort of funny paradoxical thing among chefs, right? Or at least me. I just don't ever, I don't ever cook. I've got two little kids. It's not like the focal point of what I do. Not to say that I don't love home cooking, but I, I really, I guess I sort of discovered how much I really enjoy it, you know? And from an instructional standpoint, it's really cool. I mean, I was, uh, so there wasn't too much um, crossing over. Like I'm involved with all the restaurants to a varying degree. Zahav is like where I'm at all the time. But so I would sort of practice social distancing. I would come up with new menu items in my home. Uh -huh. This is a very easy way to teach people, right? Because you can, there's not a hundred different things happening at the same time. It's yeah. not service. Um, you don't have to schedule a time for all the sous chefs to be there at the same time. Um, right. So I would just like document, take pictures and actually write recipes. Right. Which is also like, you know, chefs aren't awesome at writing recipes either. So. <laughs> uh, I mean, not me of course, but so um, I was like, wow, cooking at home is very cool. And you know, we started to do a lot of zooms with people. I was doing a bunch of Instagram lives with people in Israel. Right. And it was just like, this is what we kind of have to do. This is what we do. Even at lineups at Zahav before service for over a decade, I say, um, you know, like if there was a way that we could just bring everybody over to Israel, I would do that. Like that's what we would do. I mean, do. you're literally your kitchen, your staff. My kitchen, all my, my, all my, my, my team members and all of our guests. If we could just yeah. bring them to Israel that would be great. We cannot do that. So we're going to like cook dinner for them. Right. And I feel like this is just another kind of extension of that. This is kind of another way to do it, you know, and right. it's a way for me to do it without losing my mind because I haven't been there in like over a year. Right. Long for me. And uh, I don't know, you know, I got my kitchen renovated. Like I, now I have a cool kitchen, which is I've never had before in my life. You Again, could do that. I right. could do that. And it made sense. And um, it just kind of is what it is, you know? I think that that's, that's, again, that's the pivot, right? What's important to you? How do you convey your message? How do you teach people? How do you continue this conversation? And um, yeah, I mean, that's kind of, that's, that's what it is. And like, also the, I don't want to just do like chefs from Israel that, you know, there, there's a. Meaning chefs talking to chefs. Chefs talking to chefs is fine. I mean, it's very cool. Everybody likes chefs, but like, I'm interested in like Ravid and him, you know, rewriting the Haggadah, you know, and, and arranging it musically. Like that is right. super cool. I want to talk to Osama Dalal, you know, whose family has been in Akko for 400 years. He cooks a specific kind of food that is right. straight out of you know, like that is amazing. I'll talk to uh, Romit Verad, who is a genius. 
we're going to talk to our friend, Adina Sussman, who's the best, the best cook in the world, the best storyteller in the world. Uh, one of my, you know, best friends. Yeah. Um, and that's Sasson how we- Gabay. How do you get to Sasson Gabay? Sasson is, oh my God, I love that man. He, so, <laughs> so the person that wrote, um, uh, the band's visit for like musical for, for Broadway for, for, for Broadway. Yeah. His name is Oren Wolf. Oren. Right got married at Zahav is the first <laughs> at Zahav, you know, 12. that's great. Um, and so when they came to Philly to do their press release, he was like, can we have it at Zahav? And I'm like, yeah, totally. So we had lunch made there. How hilarious. Uh, we had the bands visit there. I hung out with, uh, Sasan and his son, Adam, who's also, uh, and, and Daphne, his wife, who's amazing. They were here for a couple of weeks. We had um, Ronnie, who's um, um, uh, who was the leader of the band. He's amazing, uh, Palestinian right. musician from Ramallah. His family's from Ramallah. He lives in Chicago. Brilliant. We had the band come. We cooked for them at Zahav, yeah. and, then came and did a private concert for us. Really? On closed. It was that's spectacular. So incredible. So wow. we have a lot of love for the entire staff. I had uh, I a lot of time um, and my family did with uh, Sasan and I really love him. He's one of the, he's a, one of the good humans in this world, you know, and, mm. uh, and he uh, was just, so I was like, we got to talk to him. He's um, obviously super accomplished. His right. character in, I mean, he's had an entire incredible, incredible run. Of he's per- everywhere. He's, he's everywhere. pops up all over the place. He's been doing it for decades. His work in Israel is incredible, but he's been on feature films before. And then at the end, right, of his career, yeah. I mean, I say end, it's not like he's ever right. At the end right. of his career, he's on freaking Broadway, you know? Yes, yes, yes. Perform <laughs> with his son and his character was studied and performed by Tony Shalhoub, you know? And so he replaces Tony on Broadway. It's just, you could not make it up. So we right. get to Sasan and, and talk about Iraqi food, you That's know, Kube and what it was like to grow up. Um, you know, he was born in Baghdad, but grew up uh, here, I guess, by Haifa. Um, right. And, you know, but he's just also a regular, a regular guy. So we wanted to convey those, um, those things. Right. Um, Mike, talk to us a little bit about, yeah, I mean, this, this journey that you have been on for, you know, quite a while at this point. And you both, you know, you've, you've taken Israeli food and you've brought it specifically to your city and obviously beyond. You've done it in such a way that it wins awards and you win awards. And of course it's part of this, this it's, you know, you've led this trend of Israeli chefs and chefs cre- taking, bringing Israeli food or Israeli cuisine, whatever we call it to the world. Um, what does it, what does it feel like for you right now after all of this? Meaning you're still this guy who gets up and, you know, goes to Zahav now that you can go back there and you have all these restaurants and you have to keep on creating recipes. Um, there were the reasons that you, that you started on this path and there's where you are now. What does it all look like from your standpoint now? Honestly, I don't, I am like super grateful for the life that I have. And for these opportunities, um, I don't know if there's that much of a difference between like, I'm not sure, you know, like before success or whatever, like it's all. Not even success, just the, the sort of the path of Israeli food in a sense of how you are, how you've now brought it in a sense to the masses. Um, I feel like my life's work and the things that I've, um, you know, aspired to do, which were almost hard to articulate, you know, it's sort of hindsight is 2020. Like, it's not like I said at one point, Hey, Steve, let's open a restaurant and we'll do this <laughs> thing. I just was like, you know, nobody's doing this. Um, I want to represent this, this country that I want to advocate for a country. I think mm-hmm. often misunderstood, um, a very, uh, straightforward way to do it is to cook. I love food. We're, you know, I, I mean, we're all doing, you know, to be a chef, to be a, a, a successful chef at one point meant cooking refined, fancy European food, right? Right. So we would do all that. And then I'd get off the airplane in Israel and I'd go to Shkona Tatikva 
we'd go to Busi and sit down and it was like, <laughs> uh, the server would run over and drop off on the table. There'd be 20 different salads and, yeah. and all that. And that's the easiest line that I've like, and then like, that's what you want to eat. Right. And that explains. Right. So much. And, and I think that also, um, I don't know. So our, so at one point it was just like, this is where I'm from. Nobody is doing anything like this. People need to know about this. Right. And then it was like, I don't know. This is something that I had to do. I have this visceral and emotional and spiritual attachment to a place and I need to, to celebrate it, you know? Yeah. And, you know, I think it's so cool that other, I don't know, like there's Israeli restaurants that have opened up internationally and, and nationally. Right. And it's right. pretty awesome. It's pretty awesome. I think that we, as traditional forms of diplomacy sometimes crumble and fall apart. I think it's great that from a grassroots level, we can speak about things. I, I think that, um, you know, and I have this conversation a lot with uh, chefs and Israelis and the public and about how to, uh, what sort of comes next. Right. And I think, that right. that, and that's kind of what we, I think that what we have to do, I think that we have to figure out a way to advocate for the things that are right. I think that there's a way to discuss, um, you know, Palestinian cooking. I think that we have to be comfortable doing that. I think mm -hmm. that the arena when we can say, we can say, you know, Palestinian, we can say Palestine, we can say all those things where it, it is, it should not be political. And I know that no matter what I say, I'm going to get crap for it, you know, but I right. think this is an arena. This is an arena where we can discuss those things and we should, you know, and I'm not, I'm not pretending to be like the American Israeli that's going to be like break freaking Hala and like create peace. Okay. Americans, the Westerners have a goddamn problem with that. Okay. <laughs> we know what's best for you. We know nothing about history. We can virtue single all we want from here. Okay. I get it. There's like a ton of stuff, but I think when it comes to things like um, the sort of juxtaposition of food and people being interested in food and where they come from, Mm -hmm. the sort of like collapse of traditional forms of diplomacy, which were like to, you know, uh, represent the people that they sort of govern going away. I just think that there has to be this, this momentum forward, you know, again, I mean, there's a lot of advocacy that you in bringing Israel home. It's, it's right out there. It has to be. I mean, I, I, I know. And also very selfishly, um, too, this goes back again to my brother where I'm just like, I want people to say his name and know his face, you know, and that, and that uh, I know is kind of like weird and kind of a faux pas and kind of a bummer to always talk about, but it's the truth, you know? I mean, we wrote Zahav uh, and, you know, in the front, you know, you open the book and it's a memorial to my brother and having a few hundred thousand people read his name is enough for me to do, I don't care, that's enough. That's enough for me to do anything, quite honestly. Um, even uh, one of our shows coming up will coincide right around his birthday. Okay, It'll, which is when? It, uh, March 3rd is the show, I believe. It's that Wednesday. March um, 6th was David's birthday. This will be okay. a show that is a tribute to David, you know, and I want to, it's selfish, but I don't give a damn. We're going to talk about him. We're going to, you know, we're going to make my grandmother's pastel, which she's, she stopped making after he was killed, actually. Um, yeah. And we're going to, talk a little bit about about him and interview some of his friends and all that and I don't you know what did he love eating what were his favorite foods yeah she liked a lot of trace so we're not gonna, <laughs> but I'll tell you what my mom used to do this when she was uh, uh she also passed away a couple of years ago but you know in Israel and I, I have a hard time sort of explaining this to people here but like um death of premature death of somebody young in Israel but especially a fallen soldier in the IDF it's a very different connotation. As we've spoken, Israel's a really small country, but culturally, like all of David's soldiers would reach out to my mom, like um, all, all, um, the, all the time. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just, I mean, yes, of course, Memorial Day, of course, David's birthday, of course, all the holidays, but like his commander, who's a good friend of mine, who was basically my mom's, one of my mom's, you know, surrogate sons after David mm -hmm. lived in Moscow for a period of time. At, wow. At her funeral, he told me that he hadn't gone two weeks without talking to her in over a decade, you know? Um, wow. That's just kind of what it is. So what she would do on March 6th 
is gather all like all of his friends would come over to the house and for his birthday they would make sloppy joes you know <laughs> we're gonna make sofrito you know because it also has to do with- sort of sloppy joe-ish exactly so we're gonna do sofrito that's our family is is uh, or half the family is from uh, uh medieval spain or whatever uh great we're gonna make sofrito because i think that you can pull the meat and add like barbecue sauce to it and put it in a, in a, I mean, I, I'm not going to equate Sofrito and Sloppy Joe, but there are certain similarities. New restaurant concept coming up, but <laughs> that's, uh, that's the thing. And that's the, um, and I know that you can relate to this as well. This is sort of the, um, the sort of paradox. And this is sort of like what, what, you know, being Israeli or loving Israel means. It's really having to like, you know, either defend or advocate or push for change or I don't know. This is just what it is. I love yeah. Israel very much. And uh, the longer I'm here in the States without going over there, the more Israeli I feel. And then when I'm over there, I'm like, well, I'm definitely American. <laughs> and, uh, my foot is stuck in the door, you know, yeah, permanently. Uh, but I have to, this is just what I, what I do. So. All right. You want to show us our finished dish over there? Totally. So, you gonna take a bite for us? I don't know if I'm gonna take a bite for you guys. I need to drink 20 more cups of coffee before. I... <laughs> it's a little but, sweet for first thing in the morning. Just uh, let me just flip this. I'll sprinkle some pistachios on there. I guess, right? That would make sense. It would be nice, you know. Chop some up. Um, thanks so much for answering questions for me. I feel like all the Corona questions were really, really important. You know. It's uh, it's helpful, I think, in this time to sort of hear what everyone else is going through. I, you know, we, I think we all talk to our friends in different places, and it's that funny thing about the coronavirus that when you know that other people are going through it in a very similar way to you, there's there is something oddly bonding about it. Oddly, I say. Yeah, it is. It's like morbid. Yes. It's over. Oh, and it's different for you guys over there because you guys, every Shabbat, everybody hangs out with their families, right? It's mandatory. Not lately. Not in the same way we used to. No, I know. But it's like for us, we don't even, you know, we do that for like Thanksgiving or whatever. Check it Ooh, out. Ooh. Right? delicious. And you can see the cheese is like. Kind of so the halloumi then is salty, the salty and the sweet, basically. Nice. Yep. And then we drizzle honey with orange blossom water on top. And That's nice. Super savory, but like sweet and sour is so, so important, you know? Delightful. Delightful. Mike, it has just been a pleasure to talk to you. You too. To hear your thoughts. We got have a very good Wednesday. Well, have a good Wednesday. I said, we've got to do this again, you know? I'd love to. We're going to be there, hopefully. We just pushed our trip out again, I think, to July. We're going to be doing... I be- if we can, a culinary tour in July. Oh. Um, I've already got tickets for me and my boys. We're going to be there in August. So. <laughs> another, I'm getting there. You are going to be there. All right. In the meantime, keep on doing what you're doing. Thank you. Bye. Lahit. Bye. Lahit. Bye.